Hello, here from Nestle headquarters and welcome to this virtual visit of the Nature and Water Conservation Program at the source of Enye or Ecobra, like we call it here. My name is uh, Christian Wusswurz and I'm delighted to be your virtual tour guide today. Water is a priority for Nestle and it has always been a priority for Nestle. Back in 1865, we built our first milk powder factory next to the local river here in Veve, La Veves. And La Veves provided energy, La Veves provided transport connection, and it provided the water used to run and operate the factory. But it's not only a question about having water in the right quantity, but equally so in the right quality, which is why at Nestle already in the 1930s we built our first water treatment plant. Then in the year 2000s, uh, water became really a strategic priority for the company and uh, we started to significantly improve water management in our own factories. However, over time we realized that uh, being a good water steward in our own factory is a good thing, but water really is a shared resource. It's a shared responsibility together with other, other water users and we have to take care of this, of this precious resource collectively with others. Which is why in 2018 we uh, launched the Caring for Water initiative. Now the Caring for Water initiative comes with four pillars. The first one, water in factories. The second one, uh, our work on water in the watersheds collectively with other users. Water in the agriculture supply chain where our big biggest water use is. And then with communities especially on providing access to water and sanitation. And really the Ecobra project that we'll visit today is really a perfect demonstration of this Caring for Water initiative. We have prepared for you an exciting program. We'll start with an introduction video of Enya and Ecobra. We'll then go live into, into, into the Bra uh, with an introduction by Cedric Ecker of the water cycle in Enya followed by an interview with one of the farmers, Olivier Mayor, who will be interviewed by Michael Schmidt. We'll then show you a video of the biogas power station, an important element of the Ecobra project. We'll then go back to Cedric Ecker, who will introduce us to the Nestle Water Sustainability Agenda. And at the end, we have a, a reserved enough time for a Q&A session. So please plug in your questions in the text box of uh, Microsoft Teams. And now lay back, enjoy, and I'll see you back in 45 minutes from now. Enye is a small village in the French-speaking western part of Switzerland. It is located in the Bois Valley, north of Lake Geneva, which is intensively used for farming, except for 120 hectares above the village of Enye. This area is home to Nestlé's Eco Bois program, where the protection of nature and the bottling of mineral water go hand in hand. But before exploring this unique program, let's set the scene. Enye is tiny, but most people in Switzerland know it without ever having been there for its famous product. Enye is the Swiss mineral water, to the point where Swiss people used to simply order a henye when they wanted to drink mineral water in a restaurant. The springs of henye were already used in antiquity for the Roman baths in nearby Avanche, capital of Roman Switzerland. After the decline of the Roman Empire, it took several centuries until a doctor built a spa hotel in the 17th century to make henye a place for cure and baths for the upper class. Another 200 years later, in 1905, the first industrial bottling facility of Henye mineral water was established. At the time, mineral water was sold to bathing tourists and in pharmacies as a takeaway cure. In the second half of the century, mineral water became a mainstream everyday drink rather than a remedy. Henye was the first mineral water sold across the entire country and quickly became the preferred brand of the Swiss. 
Nestle took over the Henye Mineral Springs in 2008. Today, over 90 million bottles of Henye mineral water are sold each year. Sustainability is at the very heart of the Henye brand. The bottling site in Henye operates with over 80% renewable energy, partially generated by a biogas plant next door. In the factory, Henye is filled both into returnable glass bottles, sold mainly in restaurants, and into PET bottles. All Henye PET bottles are made with at least 75% recycled PET. This means that emptied PET bottles are transformed into new ones made of recycled PET without tapping into new petrol resources. In Switzerland, over 80% of all PET bottles are recycled thanks to this bottle-to-bottle -bottle circular economy loop. However, sustainability never begins or ends just at the factory gate. This is particularly true for a natural product like mineral water, which is generated from rainfalls that seep through layers of rock, where they are naturally cleaned and enriched with minerals. After a long journey, 10 years in Henye, the precious mineral water emerges and is collected in underground springs. In Switzerland, as in most of Europe, the term mineral water is precisely defined in legal terms. It must come from underground sources and be microbiologically and bacteriologically safe to drink. It must be bottled at the source site and have a constant mineral composition over time. Accordingly, each mineral water has a unique taste and identity. It is vital to protect its source and its catchment area. Everything that happens on the surface, agriculture, roads, industry, housing, can have an impact on the soil and the underground water. It is very simple. Good water starts with healthy nature. In order to protect it, all local stakeholders need to work together and act responsibly. However, any measures need to be extremely well thought out as their impact will only appear years later, once the water has concluded its underground journey. Henye is situated in the Bois Valley, a highly agricultural region with crops like cereals, sugar beet, corn, canola and potatoes grown with the help of diverse chemical but also organic substances. This is why, one year after taking over the Henye Springs, Nestlé launched the Eco Bois program, building on existing source protection efforts. Since 2009, Eco Bois has launched numerous projects in collaboration with the local partners with some great results. 120 hectares of conservation area where no pesticide must be used. 30 fruit tree varieties were newly planted. 500,000 happy bees buzz around the protected area. 60 farmers and three municipalities are partnering with Nestlé. With Eco Bois, 3,000 tonnes of CO2 are saved, which corresponds to an average car driving 20 million kilometres. Eco Bois has become a lighthouse for sustainable water management for all parties involved harmonizing environmental protection and business development in the Henya region. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome here in this beautiful piece of nature, the core of the Domaine Daigné, where the water journey is actually uh, starting. My name is Cédric Egger. 
I'm the water stewardship lead at Nestle Waters. And uh, uh, through this presentation, I would like to let you understand what is really the water circle cycle here in Eni. Uh, to do so, uh, we normally use this kind of uh, presentation or poster where uh, we actually summarize really the reality of a site, the perimeter of the water resources the way the water cycle is currently uh, taking place and uh, uh, in order to help each and everyone in the communities but also the stakeholders uh, the people within the company and so on to understand the key topics on this water cycle we systematically represent this uh, um, in this way because we want to uh, let understand the essence of how the water cycle is working everywhere we operate. Um, you can see here after the presentation we had first that we are currently in the core of Switzerland, actually uh, structurally on the plateau in Switzerland. We have in the south, in this side, the Alps. We have in the north, the Jura, and we are situated here exactly in the middle. It's actually Switzerland considered the, the water castle of, of Europe. Uh, you can see that many big rivers of Europe are starting actually in Switzerland. Um, now, if we if we deep dive a little bit on this uh, uh, geological situation that you can see here, we have the whole watershed that is represented here. And if we go a little bit deep dive in this, in this 3D block diagram, uh, you can understand that uh, the water journey, which is starting here exactly where we are, is more or less uh, taking 10 years between the time the rainfalls are coming on the... Um, on the recharge area, going and seeping into the rocks and finally uh, falling down into the, the, the springs where we are taking the water uh, to uh, send it by gravity to, to the factory. Um, the hydrogeological context here is very specific to this area. I would say it's on the one hand something quite common from the Swiss plateau, as we said, but the water takes, as I said, more or less 10 years from the recharge here on the ground to the, the springs. And this is why it is so important to first understand well how this water cycle is working, but also on the perimeter where we are operating to be together with the local stakeholders and to understand any kind of activity that is taking place in this water cycle in order to ensure that all the different activities are done in a very harmonized way and as a matter of fact what we try systematically to do is to convert uh, threats or, or risk for the different stakeholders into opportunities by building projects together and by uh, engaging with the local stakeholders to ensure that we can get together a sustainable use of this uh, uh, natural resource. Um, it is also very key in this kind of representation to get as a very first step the, the also the water balance. So uh, this helps us, of course, to try to uh, ensure that we all have uh, the same picture of water availability in terms of volumes. So not only where the water is coming from, where it is uh, stored and where it is going out of the system, but what are the volumes we are talking about. In this case, you can see, and this is why we represent it this way, we have to highlight all, I mean, the essence of the recharge on the one hand, but also all the discharge that are taken either naturally or by different stakeholders out of the system and we need to be very careful in terms of balance of this to ensure that over a long term there is still quite a big amount of water we say normally the two-third of the of the water which is available for the environment for the different stakeholders and so on to ensure this sustainable uh, uh, management of the resources so this is in essence what uh, uh, this kind of representation aims at really highlighting it helps us also definitely to trigger the right discussion when we are with the local stakeholders around the table to highlight what are the threats that we all think we have and to work together uh, for this uh, uh, resolution of these uh, these um, these potential threats so uh, having said this uh, I will then let you know typically what kind of collaboration we've got that uh, uh, we would like to share with you and I will give the floor actually to uh, Mike who will interview one of the stakeholders with whom we are working uh, since a lot of years and uh, uh, with this I provide you the floor Mike Hello, I am Maike Schmidt from Nestle Water Switzerland and I'm here today with Olivier Major. He is a local farmer and his family has been working their earth here for several centuries. Bonjour Olivier, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Olivier, tell me, what's your role in this program? 
My role in this program, um, I am in the committee for the network of biodiversity of the of the of Nestle of uh, Enie. And uh, in the committee, I am the responsible for. The, I have the responsibility of the um, the pra practical pra practice and the application in the um, in the nature. Okay, and this committee is how many people does it include? Who is uh, we are five, and uh, it's uh, one president, one secretary. Different is a committee from a network, and we are related to the the state. To, and the state is related to the to the federal state of uh, agricultural politics. Okay. It's an application of um, polit um, political uh, agriculture in Switzerland. Okay, what made you join Ecobra ten years ago when it was launched? Why did you decide to to go with it? We decide. Uh, I decided to go because uh, I was interested into developing uh, the more diversity and more uh, application of um, of uh, ecology. Because um, that was the trend. It's it's changing. It was cha at the time. It was really a, a big change in the mentalities from farmers, and also in the agricultural politics. So we had two, and we we had two uh, solutions. So we had two approach the politics approach and also the, the the private approach of environment and the change of the, the mining of, of farming. Mm -hmm. um, what is your experience with this? Uh, what has changed since uh, Ecobra is being applied? The change is, I think, in the mentality of people. It was a, s a slow change, but it, it's, it's been changing the mentalities, the approach to farming. And uh, maybe the way to realize uh, that we can not only um, taking from the ground, but also bring back and it's all a kind of an equilibrium. Like biodiversity is an, is, is an equilibrium of the nature. And uh, when you take, you have to give something back and um, it's a different approach and uh, sensibility as well. Mm -hmm. And what do you do exactly? Could you explain how you uh, apply this approach that has changed? Uh, in the network, is to, the network is used to put together biodiversity programs. So before, all, every farmer had his own application. And now it's like to put in network uh, an application of, uh, of on over 2,500 hectares is to have a um, like a uh, relation between all the, the measures that are uh, individuals. They are put together in a network to have a better application with uh, um, biologists that follow the program for eight years and with a control from the state government and the federal government in, uh, in an agricultural practice. And what are these, you mentioned measured, what, what, what measures, what are these measures? Measure is uh, we have to put some um, seven percent of the farm is put into uh, natural prairie, which are much more rich in insect. Uh, measure are you're not allowed to to cut the grass to cut the hay before the 15th of June to have a complete cycle of the insect. So we leave also 10 percent not cut to make a, like a reservation or refuge for insects and to the insect are also uh, feed for the birds so it's all uh, related a bit from from insect to the birds to to the the, the, the trees and, and the plants so it's a, it's a part of the measure we have uh, old trees we plant replanting old fruit trees varieties it's a lot of uh, it's like a trend of measure that we we have the choice we we have a um, possibility to choice what what kind of measure we want to take that really um, are concretizing of our farm because every farm is different every condition is different so we have a big panel of um, of choice to make uh, the the better application as as we can on or specifically on the private farm and then it's all all the, the all that is put together and that's made the network um, you said just uh, the um, the fruit trees what's the interest of planting old fruit trees why do you do that so on the domain we had uh, we had a patch of forestry but also big uh, big part of the domain is uh, only um, natural grass like natural prairie but for 40 years the natural prairie get poorer and poorer 
which is a good advantage for some uh, some insects and some um, type of plants. The problem in the in the catching water area is that the um, the ground have less and less roots, and we need the roots to make a filtration of the water, the underground water, specifically on the on the on the mine protected area, which is really strict. So we replant those trees to bring roots. So the roots will be a filter on the ground, underneath the ground, and also the roots will go straight down and bring the water down like uh, like uh, a, a tunnel for water to bring slowly the water in the underground. Uh, the, the roots also die. So the, um, the, 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 the project is when the roots die, they bring more humus in the soil. So the, the, the soil we, we, uh, became more rich in terms of humus and it's bring a bit more natural fertilizer for the grass so it will be increasing the network of the underground roots which make every year more and more a uh, filter effect and we choose to plant uh, fruit trees to increasing we need the roots so we could plant any trees but exactly. to increase the effect on biodiversity and uh, saving the natural resource we decide to plant old Tree, old variety from fruit trees. So we produce as well food without any uh, implication of uh, chemical implication. So it's ab absolutely totally natural. And uh, we also save the genetics. That means we keep the genetics on in situ. We produce a very good uh, kind of uh, fruit. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of diversity, so it's it's uh, we we optimize really the the impact that we can have. Everything that we develop here is to increase the to go in every way to increasing the the effect on diversity, nature, uh, resources. So so is the problem. And what do you do on your farm, which goes in this direction? Uh, in my farm, I was developing uh, 12 years ago. I started with uh, old varieties of cereal. So I produce I produce wheat I produce uh, triticum monococcum which is um, I don't know the name in English is uh, triticum monococcum and um, I produce myself I transform the wheat into flour that I com I commercialize by myself the inter interesting point in in these kind of uh, crops is that we don't need any um, nitrogen uh, fertilizer nitrate to put Chemical any nitrate. Fertilizers. Yeah, it's chemical fertilizer, but it's nitrate. Okay. It's really uh, nitrogen. So it's really uh, in, in the modern crop, we have to put that because they are selected to take the, the fertilizer. But what is interesting in the old type of crops, I, I speak about genetics before 1920s, before the First World War. What is interesting is they don't need nitrogen fertilizer. They need a healthy ground, healthy soil, but no application of uh, fertilizer. And that's interesting. The other point is that they are the, the people that um, they have um, they have intolerance, gluten intolerance, are able to eat that without problem, any, any um, effect on their body, except except the health effect. And uh, it's it's really interesting. So uh, we can um, commercialize this type of product uh, to a better price for farming. And the impact of the nature is just uh, no impact better. So. That's a solution to crop on, on soil where we're not able to put any fertilizer, no chemicals. is really a good, uh, a good deal because we're producing food without impact on the nature. And how does it work for you as an, a somehow businessman? Uh, because I guess you have a smaller harvest of these old varieties. Oh yeah, the, 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 um, the crops, you know, when you have a, a really modern wheat that you push in the modern condition, you, you reach 10, 10 tons an hectare. With the old variety of, of uh, wheat, you reach between 2 and 4 tons an hectare. So it's different. Wow. So the point is to commercialize directly and to commercialize to a higher price. But uh, the quality is higher, so it's not a big problem. And um, how do you see the future of the program? What can be coming up in the coming years? Uh, the future of the program is to, to develop this kind of uh, crops and this kind of approach of the soil and uh, to develop uh, different projects also with uh, animals that need less, uh, less food, you know, the, uh, the old um, 
the old race of uh, or breed of cattle or sheep are less uh, exigent, they have less exigence in, into the feed, so we can use uh, more uh, rough feed. They are they, they're able to survive in rougher condition. And uh, it's all the, this trend is all in cereal, in, in um, fruit trees, also in, uh, in animal production. It's all the same way. So it's a way to, um, it's a way to, to produce without impacting environment and increasing the effect on, on the biodiversity. So it's, a lot of, it's, a, it's still a lot to, to do and a lot to develop. It's very interesting. When we speak of the future, we often also have to think of climate change, unfortunately. Yeah. How does that impact your work here and how does it impact EcoBroa from your view? The problem is less water in summer. Also in the spring time is less water. And now what I see the last years that uh, at, the, at the end of the year, like now, uh, end of September, October, November, we have a lot of rain. Like too much rain at the end of the year and not enough. So it's, uh, it's a bit of a disequilibrium. And uh, we have problem with, uh, the f with fruit, fruit trees and crops that they are really early as, as before. So I think we are able to harvest two weeks before us for 20 years ago. So it's a big change and uh, the last 10 years was a big change and I think it's keep going on, uh, on this way. So it's a big challenge. Also in the region we had no, we had no irrigation and now we have to a bit uh, diverse. But the, the, it's very interesting because we have to adapt very fast. and. Um, and uh, I think we found solution, but we have to be really quick in this way because uh, not to be uh, too late. And what can be those solutions? Different work of the f on the on the on the field, change the the capacity of the soil to keep the water, and also develop fast varieties. But because it's possible, it's, we made that they need less water. It's possible, but it's all on selection. It's not a problem of gene tech. It's really pure selection and what you take as uh, sources for selection. And w what plants are, are you speaking about? What could be uh, cultivated here? Any plants, when you, when you change, when you, when you work on seeds, really on seeds, and you take the, the varieties that, that was in, uh, in the bank of genetic banks, you are able to put the plants in a stress. And those plants get the, the stress, they, they put that in memory. So uh, I have a friend in France, he makes tomatoes and in, f in a few years he's able to make uh, tomatoes with very, very low uh, amounts of water and they're growing. So the, the plants, we, no, don't forget that the, the, the plants have a really high capacity of, of um, adaptation, but you have to give the condition and to work well with that. Not with irrigation and then take the, the seed from irrigation to bring in a dry place. It's no sense of that. But you won't grow tomatoes here. So uh, tell me yeah, what? I what? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. What are you? What is growing here just behind us? You you mentioned. Oh, uh, here that. is a special kind. We we try to make a test here for for uh, for plants that were not in in this uh, region, because the, but with the climate change, we're able to plant peaches trees. There was no peaches. Abricot trees. Uh, almond, almond trees, uh, mulberry trees, fig trees, and um, also um, pawpaw from West Virginia. It's a test here. Okay. Uh, it's working. They, they, they're not dying in winter and they, 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 the flower came and the, they, they start to produce a bit of a fruit. It's a test to see how we can manage the, the, the climate change also in this region, to see the opportunity for new production. Mm -hmm. It's a test. In the background here, we see also the forest. Uh, yeah. In beyond your farm, you also work a bit on the forest. Could you tell a bit more about that? Here, the forest was uh, we we we. Uh, I opened the the side of the forest because the forest was planting here on old farmland, which have no reserve of trees in the ground. So we cut the side of the forest to bring more light in the forest to make uh, a more diversity because the birds bring the seeds from the trees into the forest but the, those seeds need light so I cut the side of the forest to bring more light in the forest to be able to, to this plant, these new plants are able to grow and to diverse, uh, make an increasing of diversity in the forest as well. So that's the way we work. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, thank you Olivier. Thank you. So after this discussion 
We will visit a very important project that connects our water protection efforts with the generation of renewable energy. In 2016, the biggest agricultural biogas plant of Switzerland was inaugurated next to our Enie bottling plant. This was built on our land, but it was financed and built by our partner Group O Greenwood, and they are now also exploiting it. We will speak later to a representative of them. The objective of this installation is to turn a menace, 30,000 tons of liquid manure that could potentially impact the water if it was spread on the fields into a great opportunity, which is the generation of lots of renewable energy. Let's fly first to the biogas plant and listen to their project manager, uh, Renewable Energy. And then afterwards we will come back and join uh, Cedric, who will explain more about our global commitments of Nestle. Hello, uh, my name is Vincent Briars. Uh, I'm working for um, Groupe Greenwatt, um, a society active in renewable energy like uh, wind turbine, solar panel, and of course a biogas plant. So we are in front of the biogas plant of Ecobois here, uh, one of the biggest uh, biogas plant of, um, of Switzerland. And we are near from Nestle Waters, uh, just uh, a few meters uh, from here. So concerning the biogas plant for Groupe Greenwatt, so we have currently 10 biogas plants in full activity and we have currently one in building process. Rourke's uh, biogas plant, uh, very simple. So um, here we, we put at the inlet a lot of manures. It's uh, around 60 tons per day of manures. And this manure, we mix it with co-substrate. Coal substrate, what is it? It's, uh, for example, coffee ground and uh, cereal, for example. We mix it together and we put it in uh, two fermenters here, uh, fermenter one and fermenter two. Um, the duration of in the, in the two fermenters is around 20 days. During the 20 days, uh, we collect a lot of methane. Um, this methane is injected in the um, gas motors. These motors produce two things. The first one is, of course, electricity. Electricity is injected um, in, the, um, in the network, which serves for almost uh, 1,500 homes, and uh, will produce also heat. So we, we use heat for two things, main two things. The first one is Nestle Waters for the bottling process. Um, and we use also heat for, um, for Nespresso recycling process, which is used for um, drying uh, coffee cups. So why we need to dry the, the cups? So the cups need to be dry before the, the separation between aluminum and the coffee ground. And the coffee ground is reused in the biogas plant here to, to be injected in the um, gas, for, uh, gas motors and uh, the gas motors produce more heat and the more heat is also used to make new drying caps. And uh, for the final product, um, after 20 days in the fermenter, so we have digesta. What is digesta? Digesta is uh, put on the ground by the farmers and digesta is like manure but uh, have, uh, is a better fertilizer. And to be honest, the ID comes from uh, Nestle here in NEM. So the ID um, was to, to control, to have a better control of what is put on the ground with so many farmers is in the regions. So we have the, the ID to, to build a um, biogas plant like this one. And um, with a biogas plant, it's more easy to control what is put on the ground and therefore to have a better protections of the underground water quality. It's a four-win uh, um, advantage. 
So first of all for GreenWatt is to produce uh, more than 6 gigawatt per hour uh, per year, 100% so, uh, renewable energy, so that's for uh, the GreenWatt. Um, for Nestle, big advantage is the menu is not directly put on the ground. Before, the menu is processed here in the biogas plant um, and uh, we, uh, we put only the digesta on the ground. And the digesta have a less impact on the ground for a better underground water quality. The second uh, big advantage for, uh, for Nestle here in Enyé is they get um, renewable heat energy uh, from the biogas plant um, and uh, they use it for the bottling process. The big advantage for Nespresso is that we use recycling coffee ground here in the biogas plant process. We use the coffee ground like a coal substrate. This coal substrate has a lot of energy inside and this produces, of course, electricity but also heat. And this heat is used to, to dry the new recycling process coffee cups from Nespresso. For the farmer, the big advantage, they don't need any winter storage. So we do the winter storage for the farmers. And uh, the second big advantage for the farmers, they, they don't put directly the manure on the ground, but uh, they use digesta. What is digesta? The digesta is the outlet of the whole process. And um, the digesta has a better fertilizer for the farmers. So it's also a big advantage for them. Thank you very much, Mr. Braillard, for these uh, clarification and explanations. We are back here in the uh, Domaine d'Aigné. I have to say that this biogas project for me is, is specifically uh, important. Of course, it is absolutely customized, I would say, to the, the, the local situation here. And this is what I would like really to share with, with everyone here, is that uh, definitely each site, as I tried to summarize uh, with the block diagram, each site is, of course, absolutely unique, not only from the water issue standpoint with the uh, unique hydrogeological situation, unique uh, climate and so on, but also unique in terms of who are the stakeholders that are working in the area, what are they doing, uh, unique policy also that are uh, of course uh, uh, different from one country to the other but in, in any case these projects and the one that you have you have seen some of them today they are really specific to this site it doesn't mean that they cannot be replicated in the contrary and typically this example of biogas is for me very inspiring because as a matter of fact uh, it is uh, really uh, as I said first uh, converting big threats into opportunities Mike was explaining and Mr. Bayer also so typically for me, an hydrogeologist, I'm in charge of the water resources. Having uh, not the control, but knowing that we are talking about 30,000 tons of manure spread out in an area where we have mineral water is, of course, a big, a big headache. And we, we managed to convert this headache into a real opportunity by actually converting uh, this uh, headache into uh, a renewable energy and, in the meanwhile, com controlling uh, the quality of these uh, uh, byproducts or what we call the digestate. And, uh, uh, having the right uh, um, agreements with the local stakeholders, the farmers, we know exactly how much we can spray out where. And uh, as this uh, material is much more available for the plants, it doesn't seep into the ground and is less harmful, definitely, for the groundwater. So this project of biogas is, for me, a, a very good example of a, a combination, harmonized uh, collaboration between the different stakeholders. And I want even here also uh, in on the fact that uh, despite people believe that this is just an energy project which which is true it is totally linked and directly linked with the water resource management thanks to the agreement that we've got with the the, the person that in that are in charge with the different farmers and so on so that is very very important and it's also an ex uh, a very good example in the sense that the biogas is a piece of the overall ecosystem, as I said. I mean, this is really a piece, of course, that have been constructed and implemented by GreenWatt, but uh, to which uh, the, the factory itself is responding by using the heat which is coming out, 
also supplying uh, sometimes heat to the local municipalities, the, the, the different actors, and of course a wonderful opportunity. I hope that maybe uh, some of uh, my, my uh, colleagues, uh, the, the farmers, will also say uh, to which extent this is an opportunity for them to manage this volume. To manage this volume, yeah, I just wait a couple of seconds. We have our friends here going in, uh, into the air for a little trip. Let me know. Yeah, I think now it's okay. We are in live, so I'm sorry. Huh? Can you still... So let me know when I can proceed. You know, Switzerland is very quick, so when they come back in a couple of minutes, it might be short, but anyway. Okay, so I proceed. Um, yes, I was saying that the different uh, uh, stakeholders in terms of biogas, this is really some kind of uh, common platform and co common um, efforts together with the local authorities, with the uh, federal authorities, with the stakeholders like industrial, uh, where we convert again a threat into an opportunity. So this is part of an ecosystem which is unique. This is what I meant before. Um, more globally speaking, um, considering the different kind of projects that can take place uh, in this mindset of circular economy, in the mindset of uh, uh, doing sustainable water resource management, because this is really uh, the core of what we, we try to do, the ambition we've got is to really, uh, as much as possible, another tour, So let me know, yes, when we can proceed. Seems to be war, hope not. Okay, so I think we can proceed. Um, yes, what I wanted to, to, to say, so more globally, not only for here, is that this unique situation, for, for each of the unique situation, the very specific situation, there are many, many different opportunities. So the, the, the whole uh, challenge of this approach, and the, we are talking here about the water stewardship approach, the challenge is precisely to always the same. First, identify what are the shared water challenges. So what are the challenges from the water standpoint that the other stakeholders in a watershed are, are sharing? And consequently, a little bit with this kind of uh, posters that I presented b b before, to agree on what are the, the, these uh, uh, shared water challenges and to work together with the local stakeholders, with the, 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 the local authorities and so on, to work together to identify the right solutions that can be uh, put in place. I'm really sorry for this. I don't know if I can keep on talking. Not for the moment. In French, we say les aléas du direct. Okay. Um, so, as I said, again, uh, having this approach, this mindset of water stewardship, which is first identifying the, the different threats, the shared water challenge in a watershed, and then together with the local stakeholders to engage with them to find the opportunities that will be win-win solutions. And again, biogas was an, exe uh, an excellent example, I think. Each and every site that where we are operating worldwide, in the, in the catchments where, where we are operating, have his own opportunities, his own challenges, but also the own opportunities that needs to be uh, identified, uh, uh, discussed, shared with the local stakeholders in order precisely to get to a relevant approach that will address these challenges or that will reduce the risks, the water risks in the area uh, over, over a long term. So this is typically the mindset of uh, uh, the Alliance for Water Stewardship that uh, you, you, I hope you, you all know. This uh, certification um, uh, towards we, we, we are committed to certify all the, our production sites in Nestle Waters by 2025. Uh, we are currently at a little bit more than 30 sites that have been uh, certified worldwide. And it is really demonstrating or, or uh, yeah, certifying this approach of water stewardship, engaging with the local stakeholders in order to respond to these, uh, to these challenges. So we are at this stage now. We have still by 20 
2025 to certify all the sites. But this is representing um, the, the, the mindset and the approach that we systematically apply in each and every site. And of course, it brings me also now to uh, something that is even accelerating this, uh, uh, this dynamic, that are the new pledges from Nestle Waters that Mr. Schneider, our, our CEO, has uh, mentioned a couple of months ago, uh, uh, ambitioning on the one hand to get Nestle Waters uh, CO2 neutral by 2025, but also to replenish 100% of the water we are using everywhere we operate, also by 2025. And these two pledges, they will definitely accelerate the mindset and the kind of projects that we have tried to share with you today in the sense that this is a time frame we have a couple of years only to reduce our impact to zero in both terms of water and co2 and typically the projects that you have seen like the biogas but like many others are currently being developed uh, I would say even first brainstormed, we need to identify the projects with the local stakeholders that uh, uh, make sense in the in each of the context and uh, by doing so Again, we engage with the stakeholders, we need to identify these projects and we will have to demonstrate that the projects implemented, they make sense in both terms of CO2 and water, this water replenish. Um, Everywhere we operate now, uh, the specialist, but uh, uh, together with the, uh, the person in charge of what we call the community relation process, we try really to systematically have the same approach, having a good idea of the context, not only hydrogeological, but also in terms of stakeholders, who is in place, who are the stakeholders and so on, and finding, identifying these, uh, uh, these uh, right solutions together with them so that we can really now or next year, I would say, in, already in the projects that are existing, but next year entering into the concretization of this we will have to deliver these two pledges by 2025 and for sure uh, for some of them if we are talking about uh, uh, reforestation if we are talking about uh, um, um, uh, replacing or let's say uh, restoring um, restoring uh, lands, restoring um, um, wetlands, do doing a lot of different projects that make sense again everywhere we operate. Th this, is this is the challenges that uh, we've got today and I think that uh, if I understand the community to which we are talking today that uh, uh, many options will also come from you, uh, uh, external stakeholders, uh, NGOs, because where we operate uh, and according to the challenges again, the right solution will have to be implemented and again we are not alone, we are not alone uh, uh, working in the watersheds, so it will be absolutely key to engage with you and to ensure that the right things are done. Uh, all this will be for sure also uh, validated, let's say, or the, the relevancy and the, the um, continuity of this will be, um, uh, how we say, will be um, validated by external parties. We will do typically some steering committee for the different projects to ensure that the claim are there and to ensure also the continuity of this project after 2025, of course. Um, Yes, with this, I, I want to, to reiterate the, the importance of, uh, you know, wh where we are somewhere, we, we are the first responsible of the integrity and the sustainability of the natural resources that we are using together with others. And we want to make uh, even bigger efforts together with the, uh, the people in the watersheds to preserve the integrity of these resources and uh, even more uh, the water we are talking about. Uh, we all know that the water crisis is worldwide. Uh, I believe personally that here we have a, a fantastic opportunity to identify uh, a lot of projects, uh, a lot of approaches that can be declined here and there in different ways with the different uh, uh, person in, in charge or, or responsible or, or present in these areas. And all these projects, we are talking honestly about hundreds of projects. Uh, in, in a site like here, we are, uh, you, you have seen uh, maybe five, ten different projects. There are more than this, but Everywhere, there are a lot of projects that here contribute either to biodiversity, to the replenishment here, or to uh, uh, the CO2 uh, uh, neutrality. So I, I really uh, uh, asked also all my colleagues with whom we are uh, very regularly in contact to, to as I said, 
uh, highlight the necessity of this project, identify them, and finally uh, ensure that uh, we can put in place together with uh, 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 the partners, together with the local stakeholders, the different um, uh, solutions that, uh, that will come. And I'm pretty sure also, and this will be a big effort, that by sharing these different options, the different situations, we will be in a position actually to demonstrate that some uh, uh, right response can be applied here and there uh, in a very relevant way. So I'm looking forward actually to, you know, to, um, to, to not to start, but to even accelerate this dynamic uh, with everyone. The, the objective for us is clear today and we definitely need to uh, further collaborate for a common challenge, uh, the water challenge worldwide, uh, while delivering also on CO2. So th this is in essence what I, what I wanted to uh, uh, to share with you and uh, uh, really open to any kind of uh, question that are linked to this. We have a very, very uh, strong, I would say, appetite to accelerate this. And I can tell you that the different communities working in this area, they are extremely motivated to uh, find out who are the best partners, the best uh, um, uh, stakeholders with whom we can engage and we can tackle the, the, this uh, reality all together uh, I really think that this is not a naive um uh, let's say, uh, uh, position. Uh, this is just a reality. And we finally have this objective that are key and that will uh, allow us to demonstrate that what we do is uh, key and that we will do it together with the stakeholders within within a watershed. Uh, we we hand over now, we will have, uh, we will uh, hand over to, to Christian, sorry, uh, who will manage the questions and we will be here in a position to, to try to respond to you. Yes, uh, thanks a lot, Cedric. And uh I hope you found the whole visit uh, interesting. Um, sorry for the inter interruptions and the connection problems, but this is the beauty of doing it live and doing it virtual. Um, we have now time to go into questions and on the panel we have Olivier as our former Cedric uh, representing Nestle and we also have Vincent, I can see here on the screen, joining the panel and I've seen already quite a lot of questions have already come in. This is uh, fantastic, so please use the text box um, on Microsoft Teams to, to come up with uh, further questions and we'll try to, 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 to pass them on to our panelists um, or raise your hand by clicking on the, on the symbol that you, that, you, that you see here also on Microsoft screen. Um, the first question that I want to take is from Hermes and it goes to Olivier. Olivier, um, Hermes is asking how many hectares um, do you operate and have you seen a difference in terms of yield by not using chemical fertilizers? Actually now I, um, I work 46 hectares which is uh, the average size in Switzerland is around 18 hectares to, to be in the context. So I work 46 hectares with dairy cattle. Uh, yes, I see a difference, but the problem, the, um, the thing is to commercialize. So when you make a product with more value, you need less tons per hectare to, be to, to become the, the, same, um, the same amount of money for one hectare. And the difference is the adaptation with the Swiss, typical the Swiss uh, agricultural policy. You've got uh, opportunities to, to, to work with the uh, helps of the government. But clearly the, the yield is, is, uh, is less. Maybe with some different, uh, tech, different kind of work in the future, we could reach again uh, higher yields per hectare. But it's a uh, it's um, it's a uh, development for the future. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Olivier. Next question: um, climate change, and maybe first answering answered by 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 Cedric, and then maybe also by by Olivier after climate change. Is that something that you that you that you have noted in your analysis? You have shown at the beginning kind of the three D block di diagrams. Is climate change popping up in your analysis? And what are the actions to mitigate? 
Yes, so definitely this is something that at our, uh, I would say, small scale, when I consider it from the geological standpoint, but uh, with the historical data that we've got a little bit worldwide, not only on the springs themselves, but even upstream from the rainfalls, the distribution of the rainfalls and the, um, uh, the quantity of the rainfalls is becoming more and more, I would say, volatile. And uh, uh, the reality is that uh, we know that this is going even to, 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 be, to be worse in terms of of distribution along the year and also in terms of uh, uh, distribution geographically meaning that uh, uh, with the climate change today we know that if I'm not wrong we have 12 we will have up to 12 percent of volume water in the water cycle uh, the, the, the water volume worldwide remains absolutely the same but uh, it will be with the climate change distributed differently the, the, the areas that are already dry they will be even more dry and the, the areas that are wet or with a lot of storms and so on will be even stronger so, so the, the, the risks are, are changing, and, but to respond to your question, yes, with the data we've got at our short scale, and I would say uh, 15 to 20 years, in both terms of springs um, discharge or, or uh, uh, water availability in the systems and the rainfalls that we monitor closely, yes, we already see this very clearly. Thanks a lot, Cédric. Maybe, Olivier, do you want to say a word? Is, is is, uh, is climate change something that you notice also in your day-to-day -day, uh, farming work? Yeah, we, we see that because I started farming uh, a few years ago, 40 years ago. So it, it's, a big, it's a major change in terms of, um, of time of, uh, to keep the crop. The crop is, is, a, fee, is a, a lot, a lot uh, shorter, the time of the crop, because the accumulation of heat is uh, higher. So you need less time to, to make a crop, to, to bring the crop to be ripe and to be harvest. The problem is the, I would say, a dizzy caliber of climate. Because for some period we have a lot of rain and from one day to the other we get into drought. And the soil is, uh, is, really, is really strong and difficult to work and the plants have big stress. And from drought we get in really wet uh, period for a long time. So the, before we had rain, sun with a with a good of regularity, and now it's sometime with two months without rain, and sometime rain for two two three weeks. So it's a, it's different. We we need really a good capacity of adaptation. It's uh, it's rough to work with the with the ch climate change now. So we have to find a capacity or, or um, to increasing the capacity for, from the ground that we crop to make an absorption of water. It's really important when the water came to, to that the capacity of absorption from the ground is uh, efficient because the problem now is the capacity of absorption of the soil where you have a lot of um, erosion and that's, that could be a, a major problem in the future. It's already a problem now but it's, we have to work really on the capacity of absorption from the soil in the future. It's, uh, it's major. Okay, uh, thanks Olivier. Now I have a question for, for uh, Vincent. Uh, well, actually I have two questions for uh, Vincent. Um, first, is the biogas plant economically, financially viable? First question. And, and, and second question, would it also work with uh, human waste? And I think the question goes a little bit uh, in, 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 into a context of developing countries where not everybody has a, a, a flush toilet. Two questions, economically viable, and second one, uh, does it also work with human waste? Yeah, so for the first question, so yes, it's economically uh, available. So uh, we have, uh, before the construction, we have planned um, on um, a, a viability on um, 18 years. And um, from the f five years we are, um, we are um, the, um, the, the bio biomass plant is, um, is on. So we are on the, 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 um, we are on the line for the, for the viability. So until now, yes, it's uh, available. And uh, for the second question, no, we don't use uh, human uh, waste because um, they already have. Uh, we already have in Switzerland. Uh, um, we call step. So step use uh, human uh, waste. So no, we don't use human waste. Forbidden. Yes, it's forbidden for biogas plants. It's forbidden also. Yes, yes. All right, clear, clear answer to a clear question. Um, I want to take a question from 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 Mark from South Africa, I guess uh, AWS. 
Um, can I give this question to, 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 to Cedric? You presented at the beginning the 3D um, plot, block diagrams, the model. Um, you talked about computer simulation. Is that something that you use in, uh, in terms of engaging stakeholders? And you know how how does this work? Can you can you elaborate a little bit of how how you are using these uh, analysis and these uh, uh, you know information that you collect in your in your day to day discussions with with, with different stakeholders? Yes, with pleasure. Thanks, Mark, for the question. Uh, definitely, uh, we, we have seen that uh, the, this notion, I would say, hydrogeology as such, which is the understanding of the water cycle everywhere we operate, we, we really wanted to, to uh, uh, let's say, synthesize the numerous hydrogeological or geological studies, vulnerability studies, environmental studies, in a very straightforward and intuitive, or let's say, understandable way. And this is what uh, put us or, or pushed us to to elaborate this block the 3d block diagrams where we had to to even go beyond and to respond to a question yes this block diagram they aim not only to let understand locally when we have the stakeholder convening for the factories with the the, the, the local people the the neighborhood and so on to to it helps a lot to explain um, what is the situation in terms of water? Uh, who are the stakeholders pre precisely? What are the threats? And systematically on this block diagram, we've got uh, the, the shared water challenge that we really uh, precise and we try to explain in a very uh, uh, straightforward way. And this helps us to have to trigger the right discussion with the people when we organize these uh, either the, the, the open factories or these uh, stakeholder convening um, uh, presentation. This is absolutely key to let understand uh, uh, to this stakeholder how it works but I have to say also even internally I mean within our group uh, the, the the people that are in the field but also you know to let understand something things that uh, everyone is not very comfortable with this uh, representation they they help us internally to the management uh, uh, the top management also to explain the situation and specifically I would say the threats to explain that look it works conceptually this way and by having this kind of uh, uh, threats is something that we we highlight and in, in terms of business risk it helps a lot to let uh, to let uh, internally the people understand this but also to make clear what out of this comes as a solution so what are the options that we could think we could uh, uh, more evaluate assess properly with the local stakeholders and i have to say here precisely with with my colleagues here so with olivier and vincent uh, at the very beginning of the whole the story here more than 10 years ago we, we, we used to have some I have to say shaky meetings uh, with especially with with the farmers uh, when we organized the first meeting with the farmers uh, Nestle was just arriving in this uh, beautiful area here they were saying okay uh, uh, this is a multinational uh, uh, we know that they are going to buy the whole area and so on it, it was really tough uh, I have to say at the very beginning but uh, uh, step by step by discussing by highlighting the threats the opportunities we were able, uh, and I hope so, you see, we, we, we can, okay, we have the dissidents now because of the COVID, but uh, we, we, we can really, um, there is a confidence to really trigger some further projects aiming at uh, preserving the integrity and I would say the income of everyone, but also bridging and building things that are going really towards sustainability. And this meeting at the very beginning that we had, this is really also one of the message I wanted to pass is that by putting in a transparent way all this information through this block diagram seems to be a bit naive but to put this information on the table invite the people to talk about the threats and to find together options that will benefit to each of us I think this is really the essence of all this approach that we want to do I mean uh, green what we do not know how to do a, a biogas uh, we we we, we went to, 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 to ring at their door to say, look, you are a specialist in biogas. Can, can we do this and that? They said, yes, absolutely. We can do it this way. So we had a lot of uh, discussion together. They implemented it. It was also a big uh, advantage for the farmers, typically, uh, at least for the 28, if I'm not wrong, farmers that have signed contract now uh, with, with this uh, biogas. We don't run it. We are next to the, I mean, the factory is next to the biogas factory. We recover uh, a big output of this factory, which is the heat. Uh, to a very uh, high level if I'm not wrong we're at 86 percent of renewable energy thanks to this but and this is the best sorry to be long but there are many other projects coming now 
typically uh, uh, we still have uh, uh, an excess of, of heat and water that is coming from the, uh, the drying of the caps uh, of, of cof coffee and we already have some other ideas by talking with uh, the specialist to recover this uh, uh, heat and water and to maybe supply um, a, a greenhouse in, in, the, in the compound where we are operating there and to trigger another activity that is even further uh, closing the loop and these are all projects that are triggered from nothing else than a discussion between the different stakeholders. Sorry to be long but finally the, uh, it helps me to provide you the message that putting everything in a transparent way on the table, explaining the people uh, uh, in a conceptual way uh, what is the situation, this helps a lot to trigger the right discussion and to find the solutions. Sorry Christian to be, to be long. Thanks a lot, uh, Cedric, also for sharing this experience uh, with regards to the to the shaky meetings. It it, it looks uh, very easy today, but uh, but effectively there is a process of 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 years of work behind that. Um, I would like to go now to to, to Vincent and maybe also um, to to Olivier um, on a question that that is related um, to to involving stakeholders. Um, how did you onboard? farmers um, in the biogas plant what was the re reaction of the farmers was that uh, something easy did they accept suggestions for fertilizer quantity quality how did that work maybe Vincent and then then Olivier <coughs> so they, they accept very well and now there, there is no problem and no issues and um, you, you know for farmers is, is a big advantage also for, for storage for winter storage and um, they appreciate a lot for they don't need a, a, a big uh, winter storage uh, we do the storage first and um, and you know they are very happy so as I know <laughs> Yeah, 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 of course. The, the, the digestat is also um, very well for every, for every farmers, and um, it's, it's a lot uh, more fertilizer for for every farmers, and uh, they, they they are very really happy too with, with that. Yes. Very good, Olivier. Can you confirm? <coughs> yeah. yeah, at the start, at the start, it was hard. I was uh, alone with my cousin to speak with Greenwald, and it was quite shaky. So it was really one millimeter to the project to, to go in the project or out of the project. So you have to, to push this millimeter in the good way. And all the other farmers was were laughing about this project. Oh it never happened and so and when they when the farmers seen that this project was was going on and they had to uh, to they could have an opportunity of this project, their mind changed really quickly. When it's turned about rentability, money, and different kind of stuff, the farmers are really quick. So uh, now it's working well, but at the start, it was we had really to push at the right way that uh, the project go into to go into the project and not out of the project. It's always the same. The most of the people at the start of a project, when you, you when you bring an idea on on the table, most of the people, I would say, 95% laugh about it. They just laugh but when they see at the moment that you keep going you keep pushing the project and the farmers see or the people different people see that it's an opportunity into it they ch the benefit they really change fast and it's going uh, in a good way but it's the way to bring a project you have to have people with uh, with a strong head to push it forward and then it will be uh, the project will um, will will come if you not push, if you have not a strong, if you not volunteer, it never happened. But you have to have to push that. And the advantage of the biogas is because the, um, the quantity, the law of the quantity of the storage for, for the winter was changing. So all the farmer had to invest of their, on their own farm. That's why the green watt invest in the, in the big storage for B4 to put in the biogas. And that was a big point for farmers that they, they did not have to invest more on their farm for storage. So that was put into the, the, the into green watt. And when you spray manure direct from the cow is not the same form of nitrogen on the field. So these um, the nitrogen that come out of the, the of, of green watt is different. So the capacity of the plant to absorb this nitrogen is really faster. You have less waste. 
that's the that's the major point as well. Can, can I eventually just add two, two points to this, if if you allow? Uh, first is that uh, at the very beginning, as a matter of fact, uh, Nestlé was too low because there was already a project of biogas here in the area, and everyone thought that when we were arriving, we would be against the project for many different uh, uh, reasons. And actually, it was exactly the contrary. We really ensured that the project was uh, uh, designed in the proper way, that it would preserve the integrity of the water resources with a, a lot of uh, protection measures and, and so on. So we were even too low, a big, uh, a big company like us, to, to be together with the, with the farmers. So a very first small biogas station took place. Uh, we are discussing with them, but as Olivier was saying, they, they started from one day to the other. They did, did their calculation, they did it. And, and we, we, we came actually with the bigger, uh, the biggest of Switzerland at this time, uh, thanks to Greenwatt, only a couple of years after. And there is today a good dynamic between the two, the two uh, uh, biogas stations in, in here in the area. And the other topic regarding biogas, I think that to today, and especially with the CO2 pledge that we have committed, we, we start understanding that um, the biogas is a huge opportunity of uh, uh, some kind of transitory um, uh, period where we can feed the trucks by slight modification of the engines of different trucks and convert the, 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 the diesel or the, 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 the fuel, normal fuel, uh, in, in biogas. And this has a huge impact in terms of uh, CO2. And in terms of so of uh, of uh, the sulfur, if I'm not wrong, s some of very uh, contaminating products. So this is another opportunity that this is really triggering, at and that we shall actually not miss. Thanks a lot, uh, Cedric. I have another question for you, Cedric. The the, the whole project Ecobra it looks it looks very fancy, and we are in a, a economic powerhouse like like Switzerland. But would the program like Ecobra also work in a in a middle income country or even in a in a low income country and and you know what would be different would the different elements work the biogas plant or or other elements can you just you know how to to what degree is the program Ecobra replicable in a in a different economic uh, context yes so um, yes definitely these uh, as i said first the reality is that we've got each site is different and each site has not only its own challenges but also its own uh, response to, to these uh, challenges and uh, definitely the, the i would say the financial means the policies the um, the the in this case also for the biogas will come afterward but uh, it's a, a, a federal uh, option to really contribute to 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 give an insight in terms of Green, in brackets, a green uh, kilowatt, which is which is not the case everywhere. But again, everywhere by assessing the situation from the water standpoint, from the economical standpoint, from the stakeholder standpoint, everywhere there are some good solutions like this one. It is nothing else to respond to your question. Nothing else, as I said before, that putting the people together and ensuring that the right solutions come out of them with a be uh, with a mutual benefit. Each of the stakeholders must get a benefit out of this dynamic. And this is, again, I, I'm trying to, to summarize systematically. We need to brainstorm a lot with the local stakeholders. No one more than the local stakeholders is aware about the sustainability and about the, the, the real solutions that are existing in a, in a territory. Uh, it is th these gentlemen, they, they have much more knowledge and much more opportunities to put in place. We need to capture this, to be together, uh, finance when it needs to be financed, work together and to ensure that these opportunities are converted into something very real to ensure the benefit of each of us. But yes, this is, I would say on the one hand, it is replicable. The mindset is not only replicable everywhere. The mindset is today applying everywhere exactly in the same sense. But to have a biogas, to have a, um, a biodiversity network, to have uh, here some uh, f farming practices, this is uh, proper to this site because, as we said at the beginning, it's an intensive agricultural area. In other areas uh, worldwide where we have factories, the reality will be totally different. So consequently, the stakeholders and the response are totally different. But for sure, and I hope that we will be able to do so, we must, uh, let's say, put in evidence the different solutions because they can definitely be duplicated in many places. And I strongly believe that biogas is one of them that has been unfortunately a little bit forgotten. Uh, here, the reality is that, as I said, Confederation 
uh, Vincent, you will maybe uh, explain more than, th than me, but uh, there is an insight uh, from the Swiss Confederation, which potentially in other area where there is no coffee ground, for instance, but I think that internally in Nestle, we have many coffee factories worldwide. Uh, consequently, um, thinking about uh, projects that are uh, bridging coffee and environment, biodiversity and so on, is something that we maybe didn't think enough and that we will have to put again on the table in order to ensure that we do not miss opportunities. Very good. Uh, Vincent, anything you would like to add or, or that's uh, all set for you? Yeah, maybe just uh, um, one precision. Um, yes, in Switzerland we use only 5% of the manure uh, in biogas. So there is a lot of opportunity, opportunity to, to use more manure. And uh, we are working uh, very hard to, to make more biogas plant. But, uh, you know, there is sometimes difficult to, to start. And uh, with Nestle, it was very easy because they believe in the biogas plant. And this is the, you need just to, to, to find the, the good opportunity to, to implant more biogas. And uh, with Nestle, it was very, very smart, very easy to, to, to start. Very good. So step by step, we're coming to the end of the session and to the last questions. What I really find fascinating about this program and, and water stewardship in, in general is that we think of it as, a, as an environmental program. But as we listen to the different um, panelists that we have here live from, 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 from Henie, essentially it's also about social behavior and social behavior change. And maybe a last question. Uh, for, for, for Olivier, you described how at the beginning you were one of the, the pioneer farmers and one of the, the first sitting in these, in these meetings. What did the, the, the overall, uh, what, did, uh, what was it that changed kind of the overall mindset of the other farmers and, and what kind of recommendations uh, would you have to, to, to uh, you know, to, to work in a, in, a, in, a, in a similar setting with, with different farmers? Um, yeah, it was uh, not easy because uh, at, the hand, at, the, at the first step, the farmer was really back from the project and the uh, commandi mafia, they were not, uh, they not feel chic. They were a bit afraid about that. But when they see the opportunity, you have, to, you have to put the project to keep going, not hear what the people say, keep going forward. And then when you bring the project and they see that it's, go, it's going to happen with them or without them. Demonstrate. demonstrate. You demonstrate that it's possible. Then the farmers come into the, into the plan. But it's not only farmers, it's also the shire and all, all different kind of, of uh, possibility. I, I would say diff, uh, so a different um, approach that we forgot to, to speak here, which is The, this system, this approach for farming for all, all, the, all the, the, the stakeholders is about recycling. Because the cows, they eat the grass. But first the grass, what does the grass? The grass, she eat CO2. And then the cow eat that and she makes CO2, but we put that into a factory that transform that in energy and bring energy again to the grass and this grass will take the CO2 of the atmosphere. So it's a, it's a complete cycle. That's, the, um, that's the, the, the main things that you have to put in your, in your head. It's a, it's a cycle without end. And when you reach this cycle, the impact of the, of, on the climate and on, on everything is, uh, is less. And the impact of, uh, of the rentability is higher. So like Cedric said, It's a win-win project when you, when you develop a project. It's all about recycling now. You have to, to think about the, the, veget the, the grass, the, the, the forest, and then the animals, and then the, the, the manure, the transform, the energy, and back. And it is, it's, it's a no-hand cycle, and, and you have to find a really equilibrium in that. And when you put that in all over the world, depends every, in every different condition. When you have this approach, really, When you keep, keep that in mind that you have this approach of recycling, you can, uh, you can uh, bring all the, the, the same um, way from this project that is here in the specific condition of Switzerland of Western Europe, you can bring that in, in every uh, continent like uh, Australia, Africa, Asia. It's, it's possible. When you believe in that, it's going to be happened. Circular economy. 
Oh. Circular like economy applies everywhere, as a matter of fact. So, yeah. so this is really what we need to demonstrate. Thanks a lot. Creating cycles, creating a circular economy. What a wonderful wor word to, to end with. And on that note, I would like to thank our panelists, uh, Olivier, Vincent and uh, Cedric. I would like to thank you, visitors, uh, for taking your time. I hope you, you liked it and we would like... We would love to see you back, um, maybe even in person, on our dom domain in the future. Thanks a lot and goodbye.